All right. So wherever you're at today, whether you're about to pick up the phone and call a prospect, or let's say you're at the gym wondering about the meetings you've got today, or let's say you're about to walk into a boardroom or even a Zoom meeting now with everything that's going on to finalize a deal, or whether you're just, you know, driving down the road, you know, going door knocking, it doesn't matter. I want you to stop and think right now, what does it take to be a top 1% salesperson in your industry, your space? You know who I'm talking about, the salesperson who makes all the money, the salesperson who gets any promotion they want. They have all the respect from the owners, the management, the company. Well, my next guest is going to answer that question for you. Let me give you just a small taste of this gentleman's background. This man has helped companies achieve hyper growth and scale without hiring an army of mediocre salespeople or wasting a fortune on ineffective marketing and advertising. He got started in sales in 1992, selling media, recruitment, and then software. And he became a licensed Sandler franchisee in 04. And since then, has helped clients in nearly 500 segments of the market, selling everything from defense, legal services, spiritualism, coaching and software, and really everything in between. He's also the co-author of Making Channel Sales Work, a blueprint for building a third-party sales program. Today, he's helped companies 10 to 50 million technology vendors with ambitions to scale at 200% compound growth year on year. He's also a fractional CRO for several technology scale-ups and a deal midwife. Never heard that term before. I like that. Helping sales teams get tough deals over the finish line. In the last 17 years, he's helped his clients win 6.5 billion pounds in new business and expansion sales. Additionally, he hosts two successful and widely acclaimed podcasts covering sales, channel sales, sales psychology. We're going to get into that today. Marketing and management and another for founders and CROs in technology scale-ups wanting to achieve hyper growth without the loss of control. He's also married and has three teenage daughters. I have four daughters, three of them teenagers. So I know your pain. (laughs) Marcus, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. In 2020, 70% of all products get sold through partners. Really? That would be surprising. Tell us more. Well, we're talking about a multi, multi multi-billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, trillion dollar industry. When when you consider the the volume of products and services that are sold through third parties, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, the channel is either misunderstood or people don't even realize they're doing it. Okay. If you have referral partners, cooperation, that's a channel. If you sell through retail, that's a channel. Right. Um, so everything is pretty much everything on the planet is sold via the channel across okay. all 26 verticals. So what, what do partners look for in, let's say, a good vendor? Well, first of all, you need to be a good partner. Okay. Now, very few vendors are good partners because okay. they're so fixated and selfish in their approach and what they're interested in is flogging their product. Sure. Um, partners are in business for their reasons, not your reasons. Right. And if you don't bother to understand that in the recruitment phase, in the courtship, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. chances are by the time you put a ring on their finger, you're mm-hmm. already on your way to a divorce. I um, see. Because the majority of uh, partners don't produce. In mm-hmm. fact, um, the evidence, and I've, I've interviewed over 200 companies on this, mm-hmm. And on average, 2% of the partners generate, 2 to 4% of partners Mm. generate 40 to 60% of the channel revenue. Mm. So most organizations have got these big channels of value-added resellers, MSPs, and distributors, and most of them don't produce. I was speaking to a destiny. Why is that? There's something called Price's Law. Okay. And Price's Law states that 50% of your production will come from the square root of the number of organizations or people in your uh, network. Mm -hmm. So if you have 10 salespeople, three will produce 50%. If you have 100 distributors, 10 will produce 50%. If you have 10,000 partners, 100 will produce 50%. Because talent grows in a linear fashion, and whining, moaning, excuse-making, and blaming grows exponentially. And the problem is that most people go out and try and recruit a land army, when Mm -hmm. actually what they should be doing is recruiting a special forces unit. Okay. Special forces unit. Elaborate on that a little bit more. 
you need to make sure that your number one driver is to make your partners successful. Yeah. In order to do that, you have to help them sell their entire portfolio of mm -hmm. products and services, even mm -hmm. though they may use that training to sell your competitors or other people's products. I see. Um, okay. They're in business for their reasons, not your reasons. So they don't wake up in the morning saying, uh, I want to sell um, membrane or I want to sell Azure. They, they just don't think like that. What they think is, I've got customers who have problems. How can I help them? And right. it's your job as a partner uh, mm. to help them be as strategically vital uh, mm. to their customers as possible. And that means you have to train them not yeah. only how to sell, but mm. also you need to train them how to have conversations out of their area of comfort. Mm. In tech, uh, classic value-added resellers and MSPs and SIs mm -hmm. spend their time talking to IT. In 2019, 80% of IT purchases were made by the line of business, and IT was an afterthought. And you see this across the board, across all the verticals. Mm -hmm. um, they find an area that they're comfortable selling into, right. uh, but they need to speak to the business. And that's where you have to really help them. That's the first bet. Now, why would anyone choose to sell through the channel rather than just selling direct? People it's, are going to ask that. It, it's, it's a great question. I get asked that all the time because... Yeah. Um, you have to give away margin and there they are competition then. Well, actually, they're not. Th these people already have long-standing relationships. Let, let me give you a fantastic example. My old account executive 18 years ago, when I first came across this uh, system, okay. um, he's just closed a hundred million dollar deal. Yeah. Okay. There were 12 partners involved. Sure. And the partners introduced him to the board which he would have never have gotten into because his company didn't have that level of cloud. Sure. Uh, but working with the likes of Price Waterhouse, um, they were able to introduce him to the board because what he was doing aligned with the strategy that Price Waterhouse was mm. trying to help the company implement. That mm. reduced the sales cycle by 12 months. Sure. Now, right. when so you, without that free, channel, he would have never had that opportunity, is basically what you're saying. Not only that, but when you consider the cost of pursuit, yeah. And um, when you consider the cost of pursuit in enterprise, if you yeah. get away with 40 grand for any pursuit, win or lose, you're doing well. In yeah. Graham's case, every pursuit he was involved in was $250,000 win or lose. Wow. You can't afford to rack up a lot of those before your margin on everything is eroded. Yeah. Um, so first of all, they already have great relationships, typically. Right. They're mm -hmm. ensconced in the business for a long period of time. I see. Um, they understand the strategy, the vision, the direction. They understand the cast of characters. Mm -hmm. And they can shorten your sales cycle. And if you mess them around, yeah. they can also block you. And they may have, you know, if you, if you mess about with your partners, you better be ready to retire. <laughs> Could be trouble. Now, I wanted to talk to you about this. What are the qualities of a great channel manager? Like what, what would they need? Like what would be their qualities? I, I think they need a lot of scar tissue, first of all. They need, uh, well, they need to have failed a lot. They need experience. They need uh, being beaten up a bit by customers. Yeah. Um, uh, ideally, they should come from an experienced enterprise sales background or a sales enablement background. They must be highly adaptable. Mm -hmm. They need really good business and financial acumen. Okay. Uh, they need to be great coaches and collaborators. They mm. need to be uh, accountable. They have to execute for results. They need to plan and manage resources because the only currency they have are influence and trust. They don't have hire and firepower. They need to be able to read the situation. They've got to be strategic. They've got to be mm. self-aware. Now, okay. the problem is that historically, the people who've been put into the channel mainly are Tim Nice But Dim, the okay. one that the CEO's wife likes, uh, doesn't want to um, wants to speak to him at the Christmas party. So you put him in the channel thinking, what harm can he do? Well, sure. you're just about to move his target uh, one decimal point to the right. So they can do an awful lot of harm. Uh, or they put greenhorn um, uh, salespeople in there thinking, well, it's a good place to cut their teeth. Yeah. When you consider that the average managed service provider is owned by a 58-year-old white male mm -hmm. um, who is cool. working 80 to 90 hours a day yeah. Um, and they've already got their yacht, um, they, so they've made their money, but 70% of them want to retire, and yeah. you've got some snot-nosed kid coming along and saying, Jeremy, what are you going to sell for me this year? Uh, yeah. He's going to leave with a boot print on his behind pretty quickly. That makes sense. So what do you, what, in, in your thoughts, like what's your advice, like what do you need to have done before you get hitched with a partner? How does that process look like? Well, th this is a really important question. 
um, because again, so few people bother to pay attention to this. Yeah. So the first thing you need to do is establish, can you pin your logo to their office door? Or okay. you know, is it one man and his dog? Yeah. Is somebody beside the CEO, the top salesperson? Because yeah. if they are, they're probably a more technical rather than a sales organization. Sure. How do they get new business? Is it all by word of mouth? Mm -hmm. uh, if it is, that's not a problem as long as they have a system that's reliable. Mm -hmm. What kind of reputation do they have? I see. Um, are they more technical than sales? Do they yeah. have a compatible and complementary business culture? How yeah. easy are they to deal with from the outset? Are mm -hmm. they going to let you talk to their customers? Sure. Um, are there salespeople asking good questions? Do, are they welcoming your onboarding process? Now, this is really important. In the first 120 days, they're putting your company on probation. Mm. Um, so you've got to make sure you're setting them up to success. Will they let you train their salespeople as if they're own? Will they do regular pipeline reviews and accountability reviews with you? Okay. Do you agree? What, what, what happens if they're not willing to do some of this? What would you do then? Um, disqualify quickly. Okay. What you say no to matters more than what you say yes to. It's, it's like direct salespeople selling to people who are not in their ideal customer profile. They, yeah. they may be a 72% fit, but the customers that you bring on who are 72% fit are going to be a pain in the neck because they're the ones who are going to complain a lot. They're yeah. going to be asking you for developments in your product that aren't really cool. Um, and they're going to distract you from the stuff that you should be doing, which mm. is winning and growing and serving your ideal customer. That makes sense. Now, why do channel partnerships fail? Like what would, what would happen for it to fail? Much like why people uh, leave a company, but then, you know, mm -hmm. they leave their boss. Uh, mm -hmm. Often they leave the vendor because the, uh, the vendor is selfish. They're mm -hmm. not part centric, they're self-centered. They don't listen. Uh, your average channel manager lasts 2.1 years in tech. Why okay? is that? Uh, well, the first six months they're coming around trying to find where the restroom is. Um, the next six months, they're throwing their hands in the air, complaining about how terrible everything that was before then. Okay. And then six months implementing a bunch of stuff no one wants and no one asked for. And mm. then seven months getting their CV out into the market to get their next job. Because if they don't, they're going to get fired anyway. Um, mm. What you end up with is vendor fatigue. Because if you've got 12 of these, you're mm. working on 12 different PRM, partner resource management systems. Yeah. You're getting a new partner, a manager come in every month. I mean, you're just getting worn out by all of this. I see. Um, so, you know, you look at the really good channel managers. They typically stay in post five, six years. And when they implement, they implement on the basis of speaking to their partners and the partner's customer to find out what it is they need. Okay. Um, they're, they're really good listeners. They're fantastically insightful questioners. Sure. And they're not afraid of creating the conditions for constructive conflict. They fight like cat and dog. Um, yeah, but they, so they're, they're, they're best listeners, they're the best questioners. It sounds like they're the best salespeople, basically. Absolutely. And that's exactly what they need to be. You know, the channel is harder because you don't have any direct influence normally. You're working through somebody else. If you think of enterprise selling as herding cats, channel enterprise sales is like herding cats with both your arms and legs tied behind your back. <laughs> it's really hard. Even if it's not enterprise, you have to be really other focused. Mm. So you have to have high empathy. Sure. You have to have compassion. Um, you have to genuinely delight in other people succeeding. Sure. And that's now, not what top producers do. Top producers enjoy winning. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, top producers enjoy winning. They should, if they win, that means their clients succeed, right? So they're solving problems. They're finding and solving problems. Now, surely it makes most sense then to attract as many parse partners as possible, or does it? No. Like That's I said, with prices, it doesn't. Well, pr with prices law, we know. I mean, this is across the board, and I've spoken to so many. Uh, a tiny fraction yeah. of your partners produce the majority of your good business, and yeah. a tiny fraction of them produce an awful lot of terrible business. I'm mm -hmm. speaking to one distributor at the moment. They have ten and a half thousand partners. Okay. One hundred and twenty-six of them produce fifty percent of their revenue. Right, but because of the way vendors think. They have to go out and recruit this land army. Um, but most of them are just wasting their time. They mm. suck them into duck shoot demos that go nowhere. They tie up technical resources. They ask for quotes. They're constantly pushing for discounts. And they couldn't close their own fly. Um, but you, know, you see them pushing or putting all this pressure on. And mm. as a result, their resources are massively stretched. The smart people yeah. will go out and they'll look at their, their current sales organization. Mm. And they'll take a blank sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And they'll make the decision, 
who do we keep and who do we let go? Because if we can recruit more people like the top performers, mm. in seven months, you won't even feel the revenue loss. Um, mm. And in 12 months, you'll probably be five times more profitable. Yeah, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about the, the times we're in now with the, the COVID, the, you know, some countries, some states, you know, we're, depending on where you live. I know you're in the UK, we're over here in the US. Sometimes they get quarantined and they come back out and then it happens again. But many international direct salespeople, you know, must be struggling right now to do their job. Yeah. How can channel partners help? Well, n- no company in their right mind will be sending one of their international road warriors onto a plane with the possibility of quarantine of two weeks either end and maybe falling sick for four to six weeks. Yeah. You know, death is unlikely. We got that. Um, but the majority of them, you know, that you can't take that risk. A channel partner who is well trained and well versed in how to sell your stuff mm-hmm. can hop in a car and drive up the road 20 minutes and actually go and see someone. And yeah. you can call in. Uh, via Zoom or some other uh, form of tele, um, tele platform. Channels already have that local knowledge. I'll give you another great example. What, one of my pals, Zach Selch, has set up over a thousand channel partnerships over the last 30 years in 130 countries. Sure. And uh, he was working on a $30 million deal in the medical devices space. Okay. And his US CEO flew over and Zach had prepared a brief about the culture. And the guy said, you know, forget it. I'll be fine. I've been doing this all my life. I'm going to have dinner and go to bed. Anyway, he got fleeced for $3 million a year for the next 10 years. Okay. So whatever margin they were going to make, this guy managed to give away because of lack of cultural awareness. The local culture, people like doing business with people they know, like, and trust. Sure. Um, if you don't have that local insight, you could easily do a faux pas. You could show them the palm of your hand in some countries, and that's uh, considered. Well, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, people, people are going to do business with the people they feel can get them the best result, right? That's who they're going to do business with nine times. And who doesn't business. offend them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you like you might like grandma, you know, grandma's really nice. But when she comes around and, and pitches her latest MLM type of thing, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do business with grandma just because you like her. You're going to do business with the person who you feel can get you the result that you want, right? 100%. So why would anyone choose to take their and, and that makes complete sense with COVID now for sure that it's so much even more important right now. Why would anyone choose to take their career in the direction of channel sales, though? What's your thoughts on that? That's a fabulous question. And uh, there's good reason to do it Mm. um, because the channel chief Mm -hmm. and the channel managers have greater visibility, not only of the market, but what's happening uh, in their environment and the business. The channel chief has to be a fabulous uh, schmoozer. They need to be very organized. They need to be highly strategic. Uh, A VP of sales can kind of get away with knowing enough about their core market they have to be really very good. But to be a channel chief, you Mm. are actually looking at the next generation of chief executives. Mm. I think personally that the CFO and the VP of sales is no longer going to be the route to chief executive. Well, I think it's going to be the channel chief and the head of data analytics. And those are the two people who have the broadest understanding of the market. They also Mm. have masses of input. A channel, remember the channel, you may only have 20, 30 partners if you're smart. So a company like Phycotic uh, mm. has grown from 10 to 500 million in five years. Wow. Internationally, they are 100% channel. They're mm. currently growing 60 to 70% a quarter. Right. Okay. Now that's through channel using the stuff in the, uh, that we blueprinted in the book. Mm. Now, what's really interesting is that the channel represents the toughest job there is because you have to be, you know, you've got over 90 hats. Um, there's a lovely infographic that Forrester created, with mm-hmm. 90 different role functions. Mm-hmm. So you, the channel chief is closer to a chief executive I than see. they are to a VP of sales. And a channel manager is actually closer in profile to a general manager yeah. than they are to a sales manager. So mm-hmm. you have to have that breadth of business understanding. And mm-hmm. salespeople, Generally, I'm not saying all by any stretch, but generally, salespeople don't have that good business understanding and foundation. You need to be able to move from reading a balance sheet to doing a forecast to being able to strategize to then referee other people's kids. You have to be able to settle a dispute. You need to be able to plan a marketing campaign. You have to sort out commissions. And then you have to help them with prospecting, selling, and coaching. Now, that's not the. All of that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's really hard. 
I mean, it is so tough. I think you need probably 15 years of really solid, it's not only sales experience, but you need good mentors who've taught you how to coach, who've taught you their business strategy and planning, who've helped you mm. to grow and develop. And there's a career path here. Yeah. And you need to do it intentionally. Don't just get thrown in because you think, oh, it's an easy life. It really isn't. Now, what's one question, and I'm, I'm going to kind of pivot here for a second away from channel sales, but what's one question a salesperson in any type of sales position should be asking their prospect to get that prospect to really think about their situation, really want to change? Like, what's a, a big question that you teach salespeople? Here's a question you need to ask to get them to think about their situation, the consequences about them not doing anything. What would you, what would you say that would be? Well, there's a question at the beginning, which would be, so Jeremy, tell me what needs to happen by the end of this conversation mm. for you to consider this to be a good use of your time and effort? Mm. Uh, because I want to know at the beginning what's going to happen. At the I end. like that question. Tell us why you ask that. What's behind that? What does that psychologically do to that person you're asking? I always agree at the beginning what's going to happen at the end. The, the, part of the problem is that only 15%, are you familiar with transaction analysis, TA? Possibly. In, right. Okay. You've sorry. probably heard of parent, adult, and child ego states. Sure. Okay. Uh, only 15, 1.5% of conversations start and end in adult to adult. Okay. The majority go parent, child, child, parent, uh, parent, parent, which is always a bad outcome, and child, child, which is a terrible outcome. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you start and end every conversation with what we call an upfront contract, yeah. You agree upfront what is going to happen at the end. And upfront contracting is the art of mutual agreement. Sure. So if you agree at the beginning what's going to happen at the end, there are no surprises, which means 100% of your conversations begin and end adult to adult. Well, you, you never turn up unless you know why you're turning up and what happens at the end. Yeah. Never agree to leave unless you know why you're leaving and why you might be coming back and yeah. who does what by when in order to sure. keep the momentum going forward. And never sure. agree to come back unless you know why you're coming back and yeah. what decision would be reached at the end. Yeah, you're getting at least if they don't if you don't get the big commitment for them to purchase, then you're at least getting smaller commitments from them on steps that they're taking that lead ultimately to that decision process. 100%. Absolutely. And Alec Baldwin was wrong in Glen Gary Glen Ross. ABC does not stand for always be closing because, yeah. as we know, closers are losers. Exactly. It stands for always be contracting have little agreement, little agreement, little agreement, little agreement. By the time you get to the end, you only have a little agreement, which is so or well, or what would you like to do next? And the decision then has already been made because you've contracted for that. Yeah, it's always, me, be, it's always be committing. Yeah, I love it. I, I like it. We were speaking the same language, though, 100%. Uh, excellent. Yeah, a lot of things wrong with the Alec Baldwin movie. Definitely, definitely old school training, right? Always be closing. All it does is typically put sales pressure on the person you're talking to. And so all they're going to do is resist you, even though they might have problems that you can actually solve. That resistance triggers them to react certain ways to that salesperson where they don't want to engage. Well, th this is a really important rule. You mm -hmm. can never blame a prospect for doing something to you you never said he could not do. If you create the conditions for an objection, which is 100% of the time, objections occur because salespeople create the condition for the objection to arise. 100%. If you do that, then shame on you. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Because, you know, this old saying, one of the things that really annoys me is when salespeople or managers and they'll say, oh, buyers are liars. No, buyers are not liars. They only lie to you because they don't trust you. And they don't trust you by the way you're communicating to them is causing them to lie to you. Whereas if you used human at the right questions at the right time in that process that work with human behavior, they open up to you, they engage with you, and they treat you more as the trusted authority who's there to solve problems with them, rather than just another salesperson who's trying to stuff their solution down their throat. And it's you a completely should, different process. If, if you sell well, mm -hmm. then no salesperson should be embarrassed to follow you. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, it's you, you're going in on your back foot largely because the snake oil pushy salesperson's been in there before and also unprepared salespeople how dare you turn up uh, to a meeting with someone who's busy um you know chief exec a cfo um and not be prepared you need to have done your research yeah. you shouldn't be doing your primary research in front of the customer you should already have done that 
You need to come with insight. And this is another critical skill. Mm -hmm. Bad salespeople ask questions to gather information. Yeah. Bad by average. Uh, slightly better, but it also still appallingly bad. Uh, mm. Ask questions to gain understanding. Mm. Outstanding salespeople ask questions that deliver insight. Mm. If you ask questions that rip the scales from your buyer's eyes mm. and help them to see their world through a different lens with clarity yeah. and make them aware of the problem at its cause yeah. instead of at the surface symptom level, sure. and yeah. then uh, you've actually done them a massive service. Yeah. KPMG did a study last year. Mm. And they found that only six minutes in every hour mm. did a salesperson deliver any value when they were meeting CXOs. I believe now, that 100%. This then points to the next bit of evidence, which every sales manager should be holding their head in shame over, which mm. is on average, salespeople do not get a second meeting seven out of eight first after seven out of eight first meetings. Yeah. You've just spent all that money acquiring those leads, prepping them, qualifying them. And then you turn up and you blow it seven out of eight times. That's on you, managers. It's not the salespeople because you're the person who hired them, onboarded them, apparently trained them, apparently coached them, and failed to hold them to account. 100%. Now, I can't thank you enough for being on here with us today, Marcus. Very valuable insights that you've given us. Do you have any final thoughts or advice for our listeners? Be vulnerable. Okay. And vulnerability is the sign of the greatest courage. That mm -hmm. means... Admit when you don't know something. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Admit that you're struggling to understand what they're trying to uh, get to. Um, mm -hmm. you know, don't be afraid to uh, challenge. Um, yeah. And that means you have to tell people, Jeremy, I've got to be honest with you. I'm uncomfortable raising this question with you mm -hmm. because I'm afraid that it might offend or upset you and you'll throw me out. Yeah. Are you okay? So that's the next thing, permission. Yeah. Get permission. If you're going to ask someone tough questions, get permission to do it. Don't just slap them around the head. You know, yeah. in, in ice hockey, you know, when they throw the gloves off when they're testing them, that's so that they can get the fists out. Well, yeah. get permission to do it first. And once you've got permission, you can slap them around from here to kingdom come because you're working in their best interests. Yeah. Well, true experts, true authorities, right, are able to challenge their prospects to think differently than what they were thinking before they came into that office or Absolutely. that phone, right? That sets you apart financially as a salesperson and how many sales that you're making because now you're at this point where you're getting the prospect to persuade themselves, whereas most people are trying to persuade that prospect and then chase after them. So much more easier for self-persuasion. Can, can I make one uh, two-minute point? Yeah. 60% um, of buying cycles end up in the status quo. They mm. don't change. Mm -hmm. So that's your biggest competitor. Yeah. So the remaining 40%, 74% of those, which is 26.9% uh, mm. uh, to 26.8% uh, of all buying cycles, go to the vendor mm. that disrupts the status quo. So yeah. they challenge their current preferences, mm -hmm. help them understand what the cost of staying stuck will be. Mm. They create enough white space and points of difference to differentiate because mm -hmm. if they can't differentiate, they'll stick with the status quo. And they manage to alleviate their anticipated regret and blame yeah. if they get it wrong. Now, of the remaining 10.4%, those go to bid. Mm -hmm. Now, you have a one in four conversion rate on mm -hmm. bids typically, which mm -hmm. means that it, on average, one in 38.5 buying cycles yeah. end up in a win with you, mm -hmm. where especially if you have a business that is geared towards bids and tenders. That's mm. a 2.6 conversion rate, 2.6%, which is shocking. Is it no, any man. wonder so many salespeople? Last year, only 44% of salespeople globally hit yeah. their quota. Only 13% of sales teams hit their quota globally. It's because you're using old school techniques to sell to a today more sophisticated information age buyer, and the two clash 100% of the time. Yeah, uh, now, where, where can our listeners learn more about you and your training? LinkedIn. Best place, go on to LinkedIn. I'm over it like a rash. If anyone wants to find out more about channel sales, then ping me on there. I have a couple of podcasts, one called the Inquisitor Podcast, another one called Scale Ups and Hypergrowth. Yeah. And I'm on Twitter as the underscore Inquisitor. I love it. I love it. Thank you for being on today. Now, if you're serious about joining the top 1%, I mean the top 1%, and you want to experience more training content just like this, click the links right over there. 
right over there. They're exactly what you need to see next. You see, I release new episodes featuring top salespeople and sales authorities, multiple six figure, high six figure, even seven figure earners. And if you're new here, do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button right below, right below and join our new Facebook group, Sales Revolution. You see, it's free and there's a link in the description below just for you. We put it there for you. Finally, I make posts on Facebook and Instagram each and every day with more tips and training. So be sure and follow me and turn on your notifications. So make a comment in the first seven minutes to any of my latest posts, share this episode, and there's a very real chance that you're gonna win some killer prizes. And here's the thing, don't sit on the sidelines. Don't be like everyone else, get into the game. Join the sales revolution, stay active, get involved, learn the right skills, and we will show you how to take your life and income to a level that most only dream about.